All right, so welcome to our first presentation. This is the general, this is everybody. Um, and our first presenter is actually not a certified judge. Uh, this is store owner, well, we call him Beefcake. Um, <laughs> Eliseo Ma Maestas, did I say that right? No, you butchered it. Okay, sweet. <laughs> That's why they call well, me Beefcake. if my name is on live stream, then everyone else butchers mine. So, so I was like, to be fair, fair yeah, call you Mr. Right. Kwasnich. Kwasnichka. Oh, we're yeah. even. So uh, he sees a lot of cards, um, and there's been some confusion of late uh, with uh, the uh, growing prevalence of, of uh, counterfeits and trying to figure out, you know, what's real and what's not. So Beefcake, lead us through how that all works. Well, before I begin, before I begin, this doesn't work. No, no, it's going to live stream. Oh, okay, I got you. Before I begin, I, w I really would like to thank I, w I would like to thank Ben and Aaron and Preston for being amazing judges and, and putting in the extra work to make this happen. So if I get a round of applause for these folks right here. <laughs> My name is Eliseo Maestas. As most of you know, I'm, I go by Beefcake, which is way easier. <laughs> I was uh, born in Renton, Washington. Uh, same place magic was made, which is a pretty awesome fact. Although I moved to Texas in 1996, I met my wife in 2001 and I opened a store in 2004 and have operated it for the last 14 years. You could say uh, I'm a magic enthusiast. I absolutely love everything there is to Magic the Gathering. I wanted, I did, I wanted to take a moment to be a little intimate with y'all. This is... Um, this is hard for me to say, but it is very relevant to why I'm here today. I come from a broken family, and magic pulled me out of that situation and gave me purpose. I don't want to go into the details of that, but I'm sure all of you know that this culture that we are a part of is far more valuable than any one of us. We give... I honestly believe, I have a video game store and I have a, um, a board game and card game store. Seeing the community of the video games, it, it's, it's the exact opposite of magic. In the magic community, I have seen groups of strangers bond together and, and help people, whether it's a uh, crisis in life or if it's uh, maybe trading cards or just even learning the rules of the game. You know, and this is why I know Whenever uh, Jim Schumann invited me down here to speak to you, this is the group of people I wanted to talk about because I'm a firm believer that y'all give more to this game than the average player or the store owner or even the tournament organizer. So with, without any more, I want to bring up a very controversial topic some of you are aware of. It's uh, counterfeiting. Now, before I go into this, how many words do y'all know for a counterfeit magic card. Go ahead. Fake, that's a good one. Proxy, Proxy that's another one. Alter placeholder. Alter placeholder, good. Right, so this adds to the confusion, okay? Um, counterfeit culture, what is counterfeit culture? This is a group of people who will find a product and they will make a fake, an alter, whatever you want to call it, I honestly call it counterfeit because I think all the other terms are misleading. Um, and they will capitalize on taking advantage of ignorance. This affects us from shoes to sunglasses to even money. And now magic reaching the levels that it is in the entire world, counterfeit culture is rearing its head and it's looking at us. And it wants money. And unfortunately, that's the ugly truth. How do we... Does this, is this on? Play button. Bam. Did I do it? Bam. Awesome. Last weekend, um, a few of you were in Seattle, right? I went up there. Uh, I wanted to go by Wizards. I've been emailing them about counterfeit stuff, and I just kind of wanted to get what their perspective on it was. They, um, they're not interested in the secondhand market as much as I am. 
So I kind of went past all this because I'm nervous. <laughs> the three things I want to talk to you about today. What is an authentic magic card? Um, I'm going to discuss with you the detective skills you're going to need to identify a counterfeit magic card. Now that we understand that when I say counterfeit, I don't mean proxy. I don't mean anything that's a placeholder or anything like that. I mean a counterfeit card. And then um, I'm going to talk about the possible solutions that we have to combat counterfeit culture. So let's talk about what a real magic card is. Um, a real magic card is cardstock and glue, and it's ink. All of these are special. Wizards has rights to all of them. Uh, every card game has its own type of cardstock, its own type of ink, and its own factory where all of it was made. So it comes off in sheets, full sheets of poster board, and then it's chopped up, and then it's randomly put in packs. You all know what a magic pack is, right? Cool. Some of them, I mean, you know. Um, I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to cue this video up so that way you can see the factory. And I'm going to hand out these magic packs because we're going to do a couple tests. All right? Can I get some help, Ben, with these? If you want to hand them over here. Here. Take one. Pass it, pass it to the side. Thank you, Preston. What? Thanks. I need that. Cause... We got the video queued. Thank you, Preston. Gears to 9th century China. Since then, <laughs> it's a whole other issue. Tap. Right now your mouse is over here. So you just left click to play. Oh, just this one? Yep. All right. Go. I don't need volume. Actually, let's just play it. Excellent. There we go. All right. Cool. Okay, everybody got some magic pack? All right. The best way to know you have an authentic magic card is to pull it out of a magic pack. Straight up. Right? If it's not out of a magic pack, you do got to question it a lot. Uh, you have five senses. Four of them you're going to use to be able to tell if it's a magic card. Um, the first and foremost is your line of sight. It counts for like 80% of the data you're collecting. So looking at a magic card is a good way to tell if it's a fake. Touching it is probably the other way that I haven't been able to have a fake card get past me just by touching it. There's a few more obscure ways. The smell of a magic card. This is why I brought a pack. I want you all to open this pack and I want you to smell it. If you can't smell, you got a free pack. <laughs> most, most of the time, I know that when you handle cards, they're in sleeves. They're, you, you don't actually have the exposed card. That smell is... They're excited for what they're pulling. I can't be mad. I can't be mad. <laughs> I 
Okay, judges. I got a video here of a factory making bicycle carts, which isn't the same as magic, but it's very difficult to get footage of a Magic the Gathering factory. Same premise. They lay down the glue between the cardstock. That's what you're smelling is that glue. It's, it is, um, Wizards of the Coast has rights to that glue. It's not gonna be used on other stuff. It's only used in magic cards. This is why your sense of smell is so important. When ironically, counterfeiters probably put more work into their product than, than Wizards puts into theirs. <laughs> But that's good because um, it gives us a base to work off of. The, when these cards are made, Wizards makes them durable. 25 years these cards have been around, some of them, and uh, they still look good. They're still gonna be played probably another 25 years. Magic, when, when, when they're printing these cards, this is a precursor to me getting into this, you should be aware of a few things. The cards are not printed in one layer. The cards are printed in different layers. The border's put down, the picture, actually it's the picture, the border, and then the text on the card. So when you look at a card, as you can see that they're, they're printing and cutting it and putting in decks, that is what Wizards does for the most part to prevent counterfeit measures. Of course you know about the little, the little symbol at the bottom of the card, that's an additional um, mostly rares, promo stuff like that. That's another anti-counterfeit measure. So Wizards acknowledges the problem. When these cards are produced and, and hand out, the, uh, the counterfeiters, their first job is to look at where these cards are distributed, who's making them, and unfortunately there are factories that that try to replicate this process. To me, when I look at them, they're fairly easy. Um, the glue that goes into this, I want you to take the basic land and I want you to tear it in half. We're, we're done with the video, can we go back? What color is the glue? Blue. It will never be a different color. If anybody tells you that, they're not accurate. Um, here is just a picture of what you have in your hand. I know that this is not nearly as powerful as you, as you actually ripping this card in half, and I'm sure as judges, y'all don't rip cards too terribly often. That. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Commander games, but <laughs> it's a different. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a whole thing, but this is education and that's entertainment. So, <laughs> um, I have seen thousands of counterfeit cards, and none of them have blue glue. And if you, uh, for me, I have a very acute sense of smell, so I can almost always, when I pull it out of the sleeve. I can just smell that it's just not real. I guess maybe that may, might be part of my superpower. <laughs> I put these pictures up here to, to show you a little bit more about the layers, although in retrospect, now that, I, now that I'm looking at it up here, it is very hard to tell. Um, <laughs> but in this example, you can see that the cards, you can't see. I'm gonna tell you that <laughs> This is all one layer, and, and this is multiple layers, and well, this is terrible. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. I have physical. Oh, yeah, that might help. Can you see it better? How's that? Oh, yeah. Thank you for your assistance, sir. Ma'am, uh, apologies. Absolutely, on both cases. Oh, look, cool. All right, so this one's real, this one's fake. Right here, you can tell that this is a whole different layer than right here, and this is a different layer than right here. You can almost see that it's built up. 
right here, all of this looks like it's the same level all the way across. Um, I grabbed the picture of the Tarmogoyf because when it comes to counterfeit culture, the best way to get a counterfeit through is to not print a $100 bill. You print the $5 bills because no one's looking for it. Which brings me to Urza's mine over here. Let me walk to this side. This is another counterfeit we came across, which is insane to me because this is a whole lot of work to make a couple bucks. Um, the differentiator is the symbols. This symbol is, is, and it's still difficult to see, but it is very gray. And you can tell, or at least I can tell, that it's all printed in one layer. And then this one's in multiple layers, looking at the text down here, the text right here, the symbol, the border. So, very important. Do what? CMYK? Oh, um, I'm getting to that. <laughs> yeah, no, you're good, you're good. Um, so the glue, back to the glue, I'm jumping around a little bit, but I, this is so much information, and this is my first presentation. So <laughs> another way to look at the glue is the light test. Um, this is where you take a flashlight, don't look at it, put the card over it, then look at it. Let me tell you from experience. <laughs> What you're looking for is, the, the left one is real. You can almost see like a river of glue, like waves. And then on the fake one, it's smooth. Once again, the, the counterfeiters put a lot of work into their product. The light test almost always is distinguishable. Every one of these things, sir. Absolutely, and it's just weak enough that it won't go through some of the thicker cardboard stock. So if you can't see the light through, that's just a red flag. All of these things that I'm speaking to you of today, I brought exhibits over here, which um, after this, after we're done speaking, question and answers, you want to come over here and get an introspection of what I'm talking about, I'm more than willing to educate you. Back to light and authenticating magic cards. Um, how many of you, I want to raise a hand, have a loop? I highly recommend everybody get one of these. Um, this is the most important, ma'am. So Amazon, I ordered these for $6 a piece. These are not deal breakers. I even ordered extra. Yeah, the, the you can buy a really expensive one, but you don't need to. No, yeah, you you can. I would look at 30 times magnification. You really want to be able to see this right here. This this is probably just the the biggest deciding factor. So when you look at a naked magic card, if you haven't seen a whole lot of cards in your career, it's it's easy to look at that and go, "Oh, that might be real." One of the bigger things about counterfeit cards is that they really come in two forms. They're either mink or they're beat up. And if they're beat up to me, it's easier to tell because the cardboard stock's different. If they're mint, the first thing I ask myself is how old is this card? Because cards that are 20 years or older are very, very rarely mint. In fact, if they are mint, they're most likely graded if they have any value. So when we take this loop, and we look at the different parts of the card. What we're really looking for, once again, is the layers. Here, uh, I took a picture right here where you can see that this scimitar is printed on with rosettes. What are rosettes? Rosettes is how the ink is applied to the cardboard. In an authentic magic card, it makes this little circle pattern. And when it's a fake card, it's all over the place. Kind of a kind of a circle, but not. I don't know. It it. To me, the. This, is what you're gonna find most of the time, and this is authentic. Yeah. Also, um, you can see the symbol. Look at the symbol. See how it's all. When you look really close, it's broke up all over the place. And then right here with the symbol, it's a solid black line. The border is black, solid black. There will be no rosettes in the border. 
There'll be no rosettes in the symbol, and there'll be no rosettes in any of the typed words on the card. Please. Yeah. So it's the last layer, right? Because it blacks everything out. So you see solid black here, not solid black here. That's a warning sign, right? Because it's gonna, they're going to apply that black over the top. So all those, all those borders should be solid black. Text should be solid black. The outline on the set expansion symbol should be black. All that should be clear and crisp. If it's not, they'll take your chance. Yeah, absolutely. So um, another type of fake card, counterfeit card, that we come across is um, a reback. This, this is like next level stuff. Uh, most likely you will not encounter it, but I want, I want you to be aware of what it is. It, it is, how many of you know what a collector's edition card is? Okay, so square borders, for those of you who don't know, on the back of it, it is gold border. It says collector's edition. You cannot miss it. It only featured cards from alpha or uh, beta, and uh, you could buy the whole set back in the day for like $100. What these counterfeiters do is they split the card in half. They take the back, they throw it away, and they take the front of the card, and then they get a real magic card and they split that in half and they take the back of that card and they very nicely glue it back together. Usually, I have no, I pushed a button. Usually, um, well, thanks. Usually whenever they do this, they're, they're trying to get uh, Power 9, they want dual lands, they want the Legends cards, Tabernacle, stuff like that. Well, that's not in there, but these rebacks, what, what they're, the, the deciding factor is, is if you take your loop and you look at the core of a card, do you know what the core of a card is? It, it is the center. If you hold the card facing you so you can see the name of the card, turn it sideways so it's the thinnest possible. That thin Part is the core. That's what this is right here. This is a reback. It has a black line all the way through it. An authentic magic card will not have a black line. The reason why is that when magic cards are made, they're made on poster boards and then they're chopped up. And when a reback is made, it's an individual card. So you can see the glue really easy. Rebacks, you'll rarely ever be able to see the light through them. So that really helps. Um, this brings me to the very last counterfeit measure. Uh, David spoke about it a little bit. The anti-counterfeit stickers. Do you have you have have y'all looked at this sticker close up? Can I get a raise of hands for those of you who did? I want. I just. I'm trying to gauge how much you know. Okay. So you know when you look at it, it's beautiful. First off, when you actually look at it, it has magic set symbols in it all over and they're not in the same pattern. Um, Yara, Yara is a counterfeiter from China. He's trying, he's trying really hard. Um, right, yeah, so when the sticker is administered onto a card, what Wizards does is they take the front half of a card and they put an indentation into it. And whenever the sticker sits in it, it creates a flush surface. So you can take your finger and you can rub it across the sticker and you'll barely feel that it's even there. Maybe if you're very sensitive, you can tell that it's there. But when you find a fake one, a counterfeit one, the sticker is usually sitting on top of the surface. Or if they did take the time to put an indentation in it, it's also on the back of the magic card. So there'll be a dimple. The first generation, this was, this was two years ago. It looks like aluminum foil. Look at that. There's not, there's, you can barely tell that there's a symbol. Uh, last year, they got the symbol and they're a little bit better, but it's the same symbol repeated. So it's, not only is it stuck on top of the card, it, uh, it's not all the different magic symbols. And when you look at a real one, if you get, you know, I brought the, uh, 
the magnifying lenses. When you come over here and you look through my display, look at one through the loop. It is amazing. So, all of this telling you, why, why am I here? Why am I talking to you? Because I get to do something that y'all might not get to do. Maybe Jared is a store owner. I, I Working the store, I have customers come in and they have these counterfeit cards in their binders. And it puts me in a weird position. I can allow those players to have those cards in their binders in, in my store knowing that they're gonna, they might trade them to somebody else. And, we, and that's detrimental to us because new players, people who just get into this, you all know this, they're super excited. They want to build that modern deck. They want to build that commander deck. And, and they go all out and they get, they get that one card that they want. If that card turns out to be fake, and I've witnessed this, uh, we lost a player. They, they have lost faith in magic. We did not protect them. And uh, they're going to go and find a different form of entertainment. So this is why it puts me in a particular position because I don't, want to, I don't want to lose Magic players. I want more people to play Magic. I want them to be involved with this. Um, when not only, not only do I have a store, I also help out vendors at GPs. And these guys are all over the world. And this is when I first realized how big this problem was. I'm talking to gentlemen in Germany, uh, Italy, Mexico, Japan, and all of them are telling me the same thing. Um, at least one to three times a GP, someone tries to sell them a fake card. Every time one of these counterfeiters try to sell a fake card, the first thing that they say, oh, I didn't know it was fake, right? So that's frustrating. How do we, how do we deal with that? When, the, when uh, there's no admission to guilt, obviously they're not gonna be like, hey, I'm creating a forgery. <laughs> so the problem comes from a lack of communication. I really, I really feel like that's the fundamental. And it's hard to talk about this subject. Um, judges, you learn, you learn magic, you play magic, you learn the rules. You are now um, leaders in your community. You're already doing so much. This is, this is a whole nother level of stuff to learn on top of layers. That was a judge joke. <laughs> so uh, this is why I wanted to speak to you, I, and I and I want to ask, I want to ask for you to discuss what counterfeit cards are with new players, with old players, with tournament organizers, with card shop owners. The responsibility for this doesn't fall on any one of those. It, it really falls on all of us. So I, I came up with some solutions for this. Um, the first one's vigilante justice. We see the guy, he's at the car shop, he's taking advantage of Jordan, our new player. He's naive, he loves magic. You can go in and you can intervene. You can be like, no, don't trade for this. Um, there's obvious, the, the advantage is you're protecting this kid right now. Um, the disadvantage is, of course, we're not actually combating the problem. We're just combating a symptom. Uh, the second thing, which I didn't put up here, but this is a real thing. When, and, and I'm speaking to you because I know that you've had to lay down a rule that somebody didn't want to hear, right? They get upset. So if you tell somebody, I think you have a counterfeit card, you are running a risk of them attacking you, either verbally or physically or online. And I have lots of examples of people berating, you know, in groups of people working together to quiet somebody who, who is bringing this issue up. And that isolation, once again, is an aid to this counterfeit culture. The second solution I came up with is to go to Wizards of the Coast, right? They're the ones that make the cards. They're the ones that help us with our structure, advertise for all of us. The advantage is it is the proper channel. You can send them the cards. They'll keep the cards. Um, the, the disadvantage is they don't have a department for this. 
they um, they don't want to intervene in the secondhand market. They they want they want the firsthand market to be taken care of, but the secondhand market is kind of up to us as as players and judges and tournament organizers to take care of this. They, and I understand that they have a lot on their plate. The third solution, which I feel is the best, is education and communication. Um, every judge that level two, level three that I have talked to, all of them want to educate everybody. It is amazing. I love it. I love asking about magic, and most importantly, I love knowing that I can't play magic <laughs> through all the, the rulings. I'm like, can I do this? No, you can't do that. <laughs> but it's good. So the advantage of education and communication is that we strengthen our community, looking at the key components, the commerce, looking at the players, the casual players that just do this for fun, looking at, at, at judges, which I'm sure you go through pages and, and you're just really enthusiastic about this game. This community, we, those three parts are probably the groups of people that talk the least to each other. Walking around Seattle, I did not see very many judges at the vending booths talking to the owners of the vendors. I didn't see vendors walking around talking to judges. It's just the way it is. I'm not, I'm in, because I'm friends with many judges and I go to lots of shops all over the region, um, I get to witness this. Well, I think maybe, maybe we should talk to each other just a little bit more. The, the scariest thing, and, I, and David brought this up about counterfeit culture, the scariest thing is that they are working their way to where players can justify using counterfeit cards in sanctioned tournaments. And so this is a whole different beast. This is why I'm here. Uh, there are reports. There are reports of people using flip cards, Jace Varen's Prodigy. Let's get a counterfeit one, let's put it uh, with our cyborg cards and I'm gonna put an authentic checklist card into my deck. That's, that's illegal, right? Like you can't, you can't play in a tournament that way. So I wanna give you the necessary skills that you can see that that's a counterfeit card. Getting the decks, the, the second hand market, the tournaments dictate the prices of the cards, and we've all seen fluctuations. A card goes from $2 to $40 uh, overnight, and then everyone goes crazy. Well, counterfeiters are like, oh, I can make money off that, you know, because everyone needs it to play in the next tournament. We're all running from one city to the next city, and we are, we play these tournaments, and uh, this culture knows that we're so focused on what our individual needs are that we're not gonna see this problem as a whole. Magic is in 42 countries right now. Yeah, 42 countries. That's 42 countries of people facing the same exact problem that we are right now. And the, when you get online, you start looking up counterfeit stuff, there is so little information. It's, it is unnerving to me. I, I've made some YouTube videos. I've helped out uh, other people with blogs on this. And this, and me being a magic enthusiast, it finally come to where I was talking with Jim Schumann and he's like, man, you should come speak to judges. Well, I think this is a great idea. While I might not be a judge, I can be here to say, I want to help this culture perpetuate. I want, I want to keep it alive and I want to keep the integrity intact. There is a Facebook group for counterfeit. It has 2,000 people in it. If you feel inclined, I suggest you join it. If anything else, these counterfeits come up on your feed and you're aware of them. I mean, Urza's Towers, Urza's Mine as counterfeit cards, I mean, I would, even as a store owner, I probably would never suspect that. But yet, there it is, it exists. Somebody took the eight hours out of their day to, to make this counterfeit card. <laughs> um, submit evidence from your local areas. Uh, every judge, groups of judges, you have a community. This is your flock. These people come to you, they look for guidance, they look for um, advice. If they have counterfeit binders, or counterfeit cards sitting in their binders in the closet, document them, take a picture, put the time and place, and just 
add it to the group. Even if nothing else comes from it, we can start to begin to see where all these counterfeiters are depositing these cards. Um, enroll in the program, act, and in counterfeit testing. This is something I'd like to do. I would like to be able to make a document that says I tested you and that you can identify a counterfeit card. I would like you to take that document and post it in your local game store. The document itself doesn't have monetary value, but I guarantee if somebody walks into that store and they know that they have counterfeit cards and they see that, they're probably less inclined to, to, to use them in their decks, to try to trade them, to try to sell them to the shop. Last weekend, there's the man, Jim. He took this picture, and as I was walking around this tournament, and I was looking at the culture, the artist, I was listening to people play games, and I realized that I know that I have found my, my place in life. And this is something that I'm willing to travel to different stores. If you contact me afterwards, I'm, I'm willing to do what it takes to educate and to help everybody understand why this is a threat. So, questions? The, the full name is Magic Counterfeit Group, actually. I think it's just that simple. Ab absolutely. In the back. Yes. What, what is the best strategy for deck checks for your team to, to authenticate cards? I would say um, when you, so I've only ever done a couple deck checks. Let me see if I got this right. We're going to take the deck. We're going to sort it out by how many copies of each card there is. We're going to pull out the sheet, and we're going to check off those copies of cards. I feel like the best way is to look at all of the cards grouped together and just see if there's different shades of light in the cards themselves. That I, I feel we don't want to put too much time. A deck check already takes time. But you have the cards. You have them laid out. So this is the ideal time to look. If you feel suspect to a card, taking it out of a sleeve is two seconds. Flick it, pull out your loop, and look. I, I feel like that's the best. Sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's all, yeah, it's all about real estate. Thousands of dollars. <laughs> Absolutely, and so if you, just look for a couple, like, like you can't check everything, you just can't. Um, if uh, you add yourself to this group, 
and you see the frequency of the cards coming through, I also think that that really helps. If you know a batch of Dark Confidence got made and we're at a modern Grand Prix. Dark Confidence is a very common one. Yeah. Um, like there's a land, the Dark Confidence. I'll get you, Jared. Right uh, Tarmogoy. Tarmogoy. I mean, yeah. Oh, that's a good one. And then my follow up to that while you think about that. And I see you. Oh, please, David. The other part of that question is I think some of the same groups with you. Yeah. We can begin to network together because Dee and I have talked about this. I also own a store, so I'm vested in this as well um, from a number of reasons because counterfeits destroy the game across the board. So they're bad. But if we can get data reported and track these lists and see what's coming up. Identify them to Nate's point. Maybe we could just make a hot list that goes to the deck check area where one card is pulled out of that list for each deck when it gets deck checked. So you there's Tarmogoyf. When you take two Tarmogoyfs out, we look at them. But it depends on what the role of the magic judge is in that. Because if the rules do not allow us to intervene, then there's no point in unfortunately checking at the deck check table because even if we Thank you. It, we can't do anything as a judge. So what did the okay. rules say about that? Okay. So the question is, for those on the stream, what can we do, what is our role as judges, assuming we find something, right? Um, there are a couple things that you suggested here that I think are good ideas, which is if we have a list of known cards for that event that are probably going to come in as fakes, put those available in the deck check area. I think that's a great idea. Um, and share those in our local stores, too. Um, so... We're, as judges, we are in kind of an awkward area in this regard because we don't have authority to take anybody's cards, right? Even if we know that it's fake. Wizards um, also suggest you do not confiscate cards. We, we cannot confiscate them. However, I do. Permission, like, uh, and here's my suggestion is you know, empathize with the player because odds are the player, I, I mean, the odds are high that the player does not know. There are going to be exceptions, obviously, but they're probably not going to know um, whether th that that card was a fake. So assume that I found fake, and I'm convinced that that player really didn't know because you could tell he's like, oh, I'm going to keep $300 because I just dropped, bought this card. Um, you know, em empathize with them and say, hey, look, these are fakes. Let's make sure that other people don't have this problem. And it's a deck problem, right, because they're not playing with a legal deck. So for our policy, they're going to have to take the deck problem penalty, which is going to be a warning, and they're going to have to find replacements. And if they can't find replacements, then they're stuck. Like, oh, that's that terrible. That really sucks. Right. Let's be honest. It sucks. But it's for the best of everybody, right, that everybody has to play by the same rules. And so just try to empathize with them because it's an awkward situation for everybody. David, if, if a, a player gets an infraction in the game, isn't there, um, isn't there, isn't that put on their DCI number? Yes, that is put on with their so DCI if, number. if we catch someone with a counterfeit card, could we also put that on there in case they yeah, played it, it will, off? Right, so when you record a deck problem, because you found one, right, make sure you put in the comments, found fake cards in the player's deck in the record. I found counterfeit cards, yes. Let's make sure we call them what they are. Found they, they are counterfeit. Cards They're not proxies. In their deck. They're not the, proxies. Um, put that in the record, right? You may not know when you find that player that they've been caught three other times, but Alaseo comes along and somebody catches somebody in his store and he's convinced that person knew, so they DQ that person, right? Um, then the investigation committee will see, we got a history of this. Exactly. And if, if they see that, then we can move it up the chain. So. He made points about the th his three different options for dealing with the situation earlier, right? Um, you can deal with the symptom. I think that's important. I think that you should deal with the symptom when you find it. Um, Absolutely. You can deal with the curative, right? Which is, we now know who is printing these, and we can deal do something about it, and that has to go to wizards. And that's very hard. 
but there are definitely people that are trying to figure that out. Well, and there are different countries, so and that brings up a whole other... And then there's, yeah, but, that, but that's where wizards can do something, and they will step in if they have some idea of a solid lead that they can investigate and protect their IP because it is their intellectual property, right? That's how they make their money. Um, they will protect that, and they will go after this person. The third one is the inoculation, right? This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to share the information to stop this spread as much as possible. And I think we have to do all three. Like, the inoculation's the best, of course. If we can prevent the illness, great. Um, Absolutely. Let's do that. And, but deal with the other problems as well. I have a gentleman in the back who had a question. Well, that's all right. We're hey, talking about it today. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sum this up a couple different ways. I'm gonna I'm gonna split that. Um, so you can use what's in the deck to give you some idea of what the player's knowledge of 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 the cards is. Like if he's clearly somebody that's been around for a while because they're playing Judge Foil hierarchs or whatever. In this case, in the case that Mikey was talking about, the player might have some idea of what he's doing and identifying fakes. I, th I think but, it's a loose assessment. And I think that's a loose assessment also. But I'm I'm gonna grab something else that I think is more important there. At that Star City event that he was talking about when they thought they were might have some fakes in the deck, you've got a very valuable resource there. You've got a Star City expert with you who sees how many thousands of cards come or through other that vendors. Store. Or other or a vendor. Vendors but, hate like, counterfeits. Like if, if you see Beefcake over there in the corner and you think you got a fake card, by all means go grab him and say, Hey, Please. can I borrow you for five minutes to look at this card? It will take it will take me less than thirty seconds. <laughs> I don't Use usually your, brag about and that. This, and this is true of any situation, whether it's fakes or some other situation, right? Use your experts. One of the things, like, everyone will cooperate with this issue because everyone hates counterfeit cards. But when we do deck checks, Nate, do we do separate deck checks for counterfeits? Can we just do the same number of deck checks and just one of them is for counterfeits? And being on both ends of the counter, a suggestion that I have for the judge community, especially being a new judge, and you know, Beef and I work together, we've been together, and we do a lot of things together. Um, if people knew that they were going to be deck checked for fakes, like the judges just said, this is a part of the deck check, and some decks are randomly chosen for this, and that was announced and they're known, that deterrence factor, posting the sign in the store, those things, and all of the judges knowing they've got training, and all of the judges communicating hey, we, we went to training on this and we know, that deterrence goes a very long way. You're absolutely we will, right. We will have way better results with deterrence than with catching it. And in my opinion. what Jared is speaking of, uh, owning your own game store, having signs posted say the same thing over and over so you don't have to say it, keeps it in their head. And I feel that our community being tight, tightly knit, is really just the strongest thing. We could, we could, I, I am a firm believer that every decision we make comes down to a basis of love or fear. If we fear this, then that's how they win. That's how we isolate ourselves. We just don't want to deal with it. But if we love each other, it's really hard to destroy that. And this community is, is positive. There's no doubt. The, the one little drop of bad, it, it just can't deal with all of us working together. Uh, we have time for one last question. Sir? Uh, so a lot of what us as the judges do with custom cards is kind of more formative and we just get that, I know what I'm going to ask and I'm going to fairly expect to get it from you. And then it says the store says no store. Now recently we had a fake and I bought it from one of my local vendors in Las Vegas. Um, and I'm actually just kind of a custom card keeper and I keep the player and the mind of the player out of it. Uh, if you decline to 
Uh, unfortunately, because there is no um, department for this, I mean, small claims court is really the best. I, I was going to say like that that's the that's the other part of it, but what I'm afraid of is that he's just going to go to another store and do the same thing. And so that kind of comes down to um, when you, man, it's difficult. When you find them in binders, I, I have found so many, and I've seen the entire range of emotion from anger to, to uh, disbelief. I honestly think that if we start noting them, on our on those DCI numbers, and they and they keep coming up. That's the best proof just to get them banned from playing in sanctioned events. That's what keeps them away. If there's nothing in it for them, they're going to move on. Number one thing to all thieves, they're lazy. Number one, let me tell you, I've been stolen from in a creative amount of ways. <laughs> but the number one thing is they're all lazy. So if they have to work to get their product in there, they're just going to go somewhere else. Uh, Thank you, everybody.